I'm Chris Richardson, and this is Not A Pipe Podcast. Today, I'm speaking with Marcus Gilroy Ware about his book, Filling the Void, Emotion, Capitalism, and Social Media. Marcus is Senior Lecturer at University of the West of England in Bristol. He's also Director at VSC Media. Today, we're talking about the uses and pitfalls of social media, particularly from the point of view of developments in journalism, as well as expectations for readers and audiences and those producing stories, or as we all like to call it now, content. In this interview, you'll also hear a first, a bit of a surprise halfway through. I won't say anything more. You'll have to listen to find that. But I think there's an interesting moment in which it becomes apparent how important this discussion actually is. Anyway, thank you so much, Marcus, for being on talking to me today. Let's start with social media under late capitalism, particularly if people haven't yet read your book. What is this void that we all seem to be trying to fill? This book came out of a particular set of circumstances that I was thrown into, where I was asked to start teaching journalism students about social media and the internet and user-generated content and so forth. And the people who hired me to do that had very little idea about those things. And they somewhat naively assumed that these would just be kind of a new distribution platform or means for journalists to spread information to, you know, willing audiences. Mm -hmm. I just kind of always felt like it's going to be more complicated than that. The internet, just like any other technology, any other area of, of life, there's political economy at work, and that needs to be fully engaged with. Um, but as I uh, sort of explored it more and more, what I found was interesting ways in which the users, the, con- the consumptive use of social networks did not fit with the kind of information centric kind of, you know, information superhighway model of the web that we had been encouraged to believe in. Mm-hmm. You know, people make a lot of jokes about, you know, oh, there's pictures of your breakfast on Twitter or there's lots of cats on the Internet or food porn or whatever. But it, it, someone needed to make a kind of serious study of that and why that happens and why we're so obsessed with compulsively consuming these kinds of media, uh, you know, while Rome burns. And so I set out to do that. And as uh, you know, along the way, of course, I had this job of explaining to, you know, wannabe journalists to journalism master students who are about to enter a career in journalism, why it wasn't that simple to just put, you know, put your facts and your information onto the web and, you know, they will come, um, even if there is that use as well. So there was that. And, you know, that went for a year or two kind of trying to do my best to explain this with the kinds of theory and, and so forth that I already knew about. Um, and then I came across the work of Mark Fisher. And in particular, I was struck by his concept of depressive hedonia. And that I'm amongst the kinds of, you know, dystopian of late capitalism, that one of the ways in which we sort of self-medicate or try to kind of uh, cope with you know, the disappearance of the future, endless neoliberal bureaucracy, um, sort of commodification of everything, um, and the sorts of things that he was basically kind of passing on from Fred Jameson. Um, this, there was this sense that actually we, we cope with those things by seeking out and consuming, um, you know, hedonic media, hedonic food, and so forth. But of course, late capitalism is only too happy sell us Mm -hmm. and i went and looked at a bunch of psychological research including you know rats in mazes psychology i sometimes like to call it (laughs) not just human psychology and found very much that's the case so that that, you know i mean i'm not really a big science head but you know i'd learned a lot about this from the research that i was doing and eventually from doing the book the human response to stress and anxiety generally is actually to under eat in the case of food but when there is a, a lot of highly palatable, as they put it, food around, so stuff across pizza, candy, etc., rats, humans, other mammals will tend to switch behavior and overconsume when the, when the food is especially hedonic or palatable. So I was like, well, surely that explains why we are so in this kind of particular cultural mode of like capitalism, why we are so, you know, compulsively all the time looking at these kinds of 
pictures of food, pictures of your friends, pictures of cats and so forth. Things that have no informational value, but have a great deal of hedonic value. Mm -hmm. And then there are questions to be asked and answered about what that means for the informational content that then, you know, is consumed on as well on, on social networks. And there's a lot I want to ask you about all of that, and you cover a, a wide breadth in your book. I want to start maybe with the idea of journalism and journalism schools, because, I mean, I'm a product of journalism schools as well. Uh, I was right sort of at the point where they started to, in Toronto at least, push working with social media. But I think early on, like earlier than when I was there in the 90s, when internet websites were sort of just becoming mainstream, the idea was that Maybe we take the content of the newspaper or the content of the magazine and we simply put it out. We basically repackage the same thing, but that's, of course, not exactly what happened. Why didn't that work? And what, uh. what happened instead? Because, I mean, as you started to allude, in terms of putting content out there, we're not repackaging newspapers and magazines. Something significantly different happened. What, what's happening and why? Well, I mean, that's a fantastic question. One of the struggles I've had in communicating this to, you know, a wide array of people, students, etc., is the tendency toward technological determinism. So I want to avoid that. Mm -hmm. But the way that I explained that, explain away that problem or, or help them understand that problem is to try to think about technology opening a door. Um, new technologies come along, they enable something that wasn't possible before necessarily. They're not the thing that makes you go through the door. That's probably something that was already in us. There were several different phases of the web and the early 90s web, you know, if you think about original like BBC News or other kind of early, uh, early adopters of online news, where it was very kind of top down, what they call Web 1.0. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was a situation in which it, it probably did work OK. I remember my parents checking the news in the 90s online and more or less, you know, my dad using it like a newspaper. Mm -hmm. And because the technical affordances weren't there for it to be anything else. And it meant, you know, we, we lived a lot in the States, even though we're a British family. So it meant that he could read British newspapers online, despite our not being in a place where we could buy them. So that was already a technical affordance that was useful to him. And the kinds of things that I'm talking about in my work hadn't even entered the picture yet. But then, you know, obviously, there's this moment People sometimes call it Web 2.0. I think that's kind of old fashioned. But there's this great flowering um, in the early 2000s of user generated content and the kind of user uploader becomes central. For me, that's a great opening of a door because it means all of the kind of stupid shit that's, that human beings like making and creating, you know, mm -hmm. could now flow into this new technology much more easily. That's a sort of a floodgate opening that allows just lots of other uses. I mean, everything you ever wanted to upload to the Internet, yeah, now you can. Is it really a surprise then that the kinds of more formulaic journalistic purposes for the web get kind of not not lost, but just put to one side? You know, of course, we're going to use it for everything. We're going to allow it to mediate all of the other inane things we do, great cultural things we do whatever. It's just a kind of, well, in hindsight, it's not a shock, but it shouldn't really have been a shock at the time. Um, you know, and obviously, at the same time, you've got great change happening in journalism, which I, again, I don't think is purely technologically driven at all. What I'm trying to trace in my current research is the way in which how we think about journalism and how that's changed. Fake news is not only about user generated content. It's also a breakdown in trust and you know an erosion of certain aspects of of democracy itself that have come from political and cultural sources rather than technological ones um, making you know new affordances for us so i mean I, I don't know if that quite answers the question but i think that you know human beings are complex creatures we do lots of different things we have very very rich culture and once the web became that what lawrence lessig calls read write culture it was only a matter of time before of course, the, the top down, you know, broadcast centric uses of the web fell to one side. Yeah, well, and there's a lot we could get into. But I'm curious to, to know a little bit more about how you started to approach the idea of teaching the contemporary web and social media in a journalism school. I mean, in terms of starting to think about how you would collect information, how you would 
I guess, interpret or synthesize some of that, and then what you found to be useful in, in terms of teaching journalism students, of course, but perhaps others who are maybe would benefit in sociology or in political science or in anything like that. What is there that you started to find, and how did you start to adapt to that in your teaching? Well, in journalism schools are funny places. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Everybody's there to learn something, but nobody quite knows what it is they're there to learn. And you know, I, I, I guess there's like a bit of an emperor's clothes situation, at least to me. I didn't come from a journalism world. I've come into the journalism world through teaching journalism, learning about it that way, which is rather unorthodox and has given me an outsider's perspective, which I hope I've been able to make useful to that world. Now, when I first started teaching, it was master's students from all over the world who wanted to learn very particular kind of global news journalism, really. And that was their sort of dream. And, you know, the Internet started out as being a tiny little afterthought, a sort of 15 credit module that they did on a Thursday afternoon when they had time. And the rest of the time they were playing around in a TV studio. And so you kind of know your place mm -hmm. in that situation. And, of course, I was aware of myself as an outsider as well. So there was a kind of respectful, well, if you want to bring factual media to the world, here's how I think you could use these technologies to do that kind of a mode. And then, as I said, things have changed so much in the last 10 years that journalism's existential crisis has worsened so much more that actually I feel like the, the much more critical conversations to have around journalism in general and its future are in the ascendancy. I now feel free to say learning conventional journalism is not a bad thing to do but it's like learning how to restore antique furniture, right? <laughs> when the world is full of Ikeas. How do we make something which is neither Ikea nor the kind of moribund antique furniture that might be interesting only to a small number of people as well? Mm -hmm. How do we genuinely bring factual content to people um, in large numbers in ways that sufficiently help to educate them and inform them about the world? I don't care whether we call it journalism or not. But like, I'm lucky now that the teaching job I have now at the University of West of England is very open to me treating it that way. Because the last 10 years have proven that trying to just always be traditional about what journalism is supposed to be doesn't really work. There are ethical things that never change, of course. Mm -hmm. But in terms of the media we have, things that we get to try out, we have to, I tell my students this every week pretty much, we are inventing the future of factual media. That is the only thing we can do. There is no going back. So journalism departments are strange places for that reason, because we're studying something. We're there ostensibly organized around something which doesn't really exist anymore as far as the future of most people who are there and what it is they're actually going into. When I went to college in the States, I went to Hampshire College, and in my first week, they said something very important to me, which I now try to use in my teaching. They told me, we are preparing you for jobs that don't necessarily exist yet. Mm -hmm. And that's what I, as an educator, try to kind of do. So then, as far as stuff in my book is concerned, and that set of arguments, you know, I was really trying to ground it in a broader challenge of like, actually, it does matter that people get, you know, I mean, in quotes, the truth, you know, as so far as is possible, it does matter that people can find out what's really going on. And in a world so hungry for conspiracy theory, it's extra important that, you know, the provable, demonstrable, factual content is freely available and actually can compete with the kind of emotionally charged, exciting other content that is out there. And the language of competition is a bit neoliberal, but, you know, that's sort of the reality. I think I didn't really answer the first part of the question, but I hope that, I mean, <laughs> I hope that that's in some way helpful. It's definitely helpful. And I'm wondering then, how do you start to explain or to think about what you do in the book? The desire for people, I mean, you've already started to allude to this. People we know from a number of studies now are more likely to be depressed after putting in significant time to social media. They're more likely to feel bad, but they do it, and they do it in larger numbers now more than ever, and it's probably going to increase. How did you start to unpack and understand that and then, you know, obviously work through it in the chapters of your book? Why is it that we, as humans, it seems, are drawn to this thing that we, on some level, know is not good for us in any way? 
Well, because we're we're humans, we're not robots, you know. <laughs> I mean, how many millions of us smoke, even though we know now that that increases our chances of getting lung cancer massively? How many of us eat candy, and we know that that will like destroy our teeth and uh, sugar, refined sugar is is liver toxic as well. How many of us know that like eating Big Macs or whatever is bad for us? We still do that. We get on planes, even though we know that that's bad for the environment, etc. Mm-hmm. We're not very good at rational self-interest. Whatever the um, free market liberals might say, that's actually not really how human beings work. And I think really capitalism knows that. And so, you know, it's this kind of thing of like, we'll sell someone the kind of ersatz temporary solution as a distraction and they can be distracted whilst they're doing that. And then later on, they can feel worse, which means they'll need more distraction all the while there's an economy at work that's, you know, profiting from selling us this non-solution. And that's decades old, if not centuries old, um, as a pattern for capitalism to follow. And it seemed to me it would be extremely unlikely that social media did not follow that same pattern as well. If that explains all of the other self-detrimental things that we buy into, it must also explain our compulsive use of social media as well. By the way, I don't think it is actually increasing. Obviously, the numbers of Facebook users are going up. That's mostly now in the developing world. But actually, people, at least in Europe, are going off Facebook in droves, Hmm. Twitter as well. Uh, And there is a sort of a growing conversation around what like a digital detox might look like or how these things are not really so good for us and you know my my students who are all aged between 18 and 22 are incredibly suspicious of these things even if they can't quite bear to go off them i think that you know facebook has got their work cut out if they want to try and convince the ever all these people to stay on these networks long term i think it's going to be like the next smoking you know Well, and I think that's really interesting because while there are analogies to be made of addiction, I think you also point out that there are some benefits to social media. And I don't think um, you're necessarily suggesting that we get rid of it or that we we can get rid of it or that we should get rid of it. So then I'm curious if you see it as in line with stuff like that, with tobacco use, with fast food, junk food, candies and stuff like that. Or is this a is this a different kind of monster? No, for me, it's the same kind of monster, although I think it's kind of yet another iteration. Hmm. Um, I think it's an even more efficient version of fast food and tobacco and private self-detrimental things that we do, Mm -hmm. because it's much harder to identify the way that it's affecting you, because you can feel depressed and not really know what that's come from. And especially since using Facebook or Instagram feels good sometimes because it feels like a distraction at the time you're using it. And it's free, you know, it doesn't take any any money really to access it. You have no idea that that's the thing that's making you feel worse. At least people who smoke, I've never been a, a big smoker, but you know, from the friends I have who are, people who smoke know that that's the thing that means that they can't really run that far or, you know, whatever. And mm-hmm. um, the people who weigh too much chocolate, they kind of know that's the reason you know, that their complexion might be not good or something like that. So it's it's uh, it's it's a much better way. I think Instagram in particular, much better way of harnessing people's desire to self-medicate and making them not realize that that's the thing that's bad for them than the past. But it's just another, a new iteration of the same pattern. The idea that, you know, Mark Zuckerberg, Sheryl Sandberg and so forth didn't know, he didn't have any idea that that's what they were building. I just don't buy that. I just don't buy that at all. And so many things have come out in the press since my book was published that kind of showed some of that cynicism that they sort of knew what they were doing. There's the interesting question then too, because I've noticed with my students, for example, that there are a lot fewer, it seems, on Facebook than there were five years ago. And so if they're not leaving, then the younger students are just not joining. And so we see that. But then, of course, there are always, it seems, new and interesting things that people are gravitating towards. And then perhaps we'll find out that the next thing is problematic, as I'm sure we will, and they'll gravitate towards something else. So Well, they're already there. Instagram is really the thing we need to be, you know. Yeah. If not, then I guess whatever comes after that. But that Instagram is is really the thing that I see my students 
self-medicating with way more than Facebook itself. Definitely. Although I pretty much guarantee that in five, 10 years, it's not going to be the case, right? With Instagram, yeah. it'll be something different. And so when you're thinking about this, when you're gathering examples and when you're thinking through it through social theories and critical theories, have you found it helpful, I'm curious, to think through, say, an example on Facebook and then discuss how that fits in? Or have you found that it's better to think sort of abstractly about social media and then maybe look for an example or two? Because I think, of course, if you think very, very closely about Facebook, people can say, well, well, Instagram doesn't have as much text, so it's a different kind of thing. Or, you know, Snapchat disappears after a little while, or at least it's supposed to. And so, yeah, it's a different kind of thing. So when you're thinking about these topics, do you find it helpful and in what way to think about the abstract world of social media? Or do you think about uh, uh, specific examples and find that more beneficial? Well, that's a really good question as well. I think you, we always have to kind of try to understand, I hope this isn't too structuralist, but, you know, try to understand things from a structural perspective mm -hmm. and for me that means looking at them in the abstract first i usually work with like a rough hypothesis about what i think the structural relations are in terms of users capital and so forth various large corporations what kinds of things might they be trying to do based on the history of what capital has done in the last 500 years or so and then the way i research is kind of obsessively collecting specific examples that either support or disprove that rough hypothesis and enable me to improve it, you know, in the case where it disproves it to make a better hypothesis. And, you know, I'm, I'm researching for a new book at the moment. And, you know, I just have a folder of like, hundreds of examples and little web articles about various things happening. One of the things that's, I guess, related to this is there's a certain kind of knowledge that I feel like we lack, um, or that we are beginning to lose sight of, of its value. And that is the sense of how things are connected. You know, one of the things I'm very interested in studying is the kinds of conspiracy theories that people believe and why. And I'm convinced that they believe these things because they have sort of a sense, some, some kind of ghostly sense that a lot of things that they perceive as separate are actually connected. And they are. But what they don't have is the actual means for proving that or really seeing how things are connected. And a lot of that is about the actual critique of capital itself being absent from the way we learn and the way we think about stuff. So I guess a lot of my work is about trying to kind of bring that back in and provide a kind of holistic picture, which isn't conspiratorial in the sense of like flat earthers or anti-vaxxers or whatever. It, it's thoroughly empirically grounded based on investigative journalism and, and, and things like that, but which helps people to get a sense of like, here's why you have that feeling. So the rough hypothesis I work with usually starts from something like, I guess, in a Marxian tradition in the sense of like thinking about capital, thinking about base and superstructure and these kinds of things, but then using the kinds of very hyper specific things that the world throws up and as far as you know reading the news every morning or whatever that you might learn about i have a number of friends and family members who are constantly sending me links and articles as well which is really handy <laughs> um and then you know I, I i guess both in teaching and in writing then try to make this big picture for my reader or my student or whatever and you know the other thing i should say is that my students what i'm really trying to teach them is that you know and when they get that then they can teach me almost as much as I can teach them. And they frequently do that. So even my second years who are, you know, 19 going on 20, I teach a module called advanced digital media. And obviously digital media comes into everything. So we talk about everything. We talk about psychology. We look at the news. We look at gender. We look at, you know, neoliberalism. Look at all these things as mediated by the various digital media that they use. And so when you're talking about like, well, specific versus general, Facebook versus all social media versus Instagram versus whatever comes after Instagram, mm -hmm. I think there's the kind of one eye on the foreground, one eye on the horizon mentality that you have to have, which is much easier to have when you have learned how to look at the world on the understanding that most things are connected and they're connected usually with a kind of a sense of how capital operates. And I'm sure it's the same for you and your students, And but that's how I try to do it. I find that really helpful. And I guess in, in a somewhat similar vein, in the book you mentioned how, well, you start to talk about basically the significantly questionable, at the very least, uh, working conditions of many of these places, in particular Amazon, for example, and the stations that, you know, basically put the boxes together and send them out and the working conditions there. Mm -hmm. But you also mentioned how it's very likely 
that people are buying your book from Amazon. Yeah. So we're inside and we're outside. And I think we all, to some extent, realize that. Like, we can look outside and say, yeah, Amazon is doing some really bad things and I don't want to support that. But I also learned about that from a book I bought from Amazon. And so it seems perhaps paradoxical, if not maybe hypocritical. How do you negotiate that when you're thinking through these things, when you're talking to your students? Because at the same time, you say, basically, like, one of the best ways to avoid all of these damaging results is simply to get rid of your Facebook, get rid of or stop using Amazon, these kinds of things, but knowing that it's not that simple. So you're teaching journalism students how to use social media, but you're also saying that it might be best if you stop using social media. How do you negotiate those sort of extremes? That's, I mean, you're you're just, it's just one great question (laughs) after another. Um, Well, you know, I get asked a lot, can the master's tools demolish the master's house? Mm -hmm. You know, can you use social media against the social media networks? And it really depends on what kind of mood I'm in. But generally, my answer is no. If you're going to stray even a tiny bit into that, you have to understand you're probably helping them more than they're helping you. Mm. That's not to say that, as, that there aren't benefits, practical benefits to using these platforms. Whilst I was writing the book, although this isn't in the book, I lost my wallet, which contained my green card. And I would have been really screwed. But thankfully, someone found me via Facebook because I was on it at that time and I was able to get my stuff back. Hmm. So, you know, whether it's a a tiny like micro sort of personal benefit like that or something massive, obviously, that's part of the picture. And like there wouldn't be 2.5 billion monthly active users on Facebook if there weren't benefits. That's how they operate. But, you know, using these things to cope is like living on Big Macs. It's like Mark Fisher says in his description of depressive hedonia. People don't realize that the thing they're looking for is beyond the pleasure principle, right? Mm -hmm. It's not Nietzsche. Nietzsche or a hamburger, you can't possibly compare them. Reading Nietzsche is difficult. Eating a hamburger is, I've never eaten one, but supposedly (laughs) very nice. The point being that there are certain things that go beyond hedonia. And so if we're using hedonic stuff like social media to cope, that's obviously something that we should be off. I, I'm now off Instagram. I'm off Facebook. But interestingly, I do still use them for work, partly because I work in public engagement as well as teaching. And people want to engage with those people who are still on these platforms mm-hmm. and you know spread information. And journalists are in that group as well. And so there is a conversation to be had about, well, as long as people are actually on there, if that's where people are, then that's kind of where we need to go to get them. But we always need to be aware of and keep in mind the fact that this is a situation that we should not do anything more than absolutely necessary to support. And it's something that should be short term. Mm -hmm. Like I've seen plenty of people say, right, I'm only going to use Signal for my personal messaging. I'm going to go on Mastodon instead of Twitter, where I have like 12 followers instead of 1200 and think that they can opt out completely. The point is, these things are part of late capitalism. You can't opt out. Even if you did, you're only opting out of the bits that you, you know, you're still part of late capitalism. You could go up a mountain and wear an old sack. That old sack probably still would have come from some part of late capitalism. And so we have to have much bigger conversations, really, about how everything is structured and how sustainable everything is and how equitable everything is if we really want to solve these problems. Just seceding from Facebook or whatever isn't the answer. And I think people who kind of think they're better than everyone else because they've done that is not really the right approach. If you've done that, great. But actually, you should be then supporting others. If we see people who are trapped in some kind of compulsive coping relationship with any part of what late capitalism offers, that's something that should bring about solidarity and a conversation about big issues that that reflects rather than oh, well, why are you still using that app or whatever? It's not a helpful approach, I don't think. But we are all complicit in this stuff. Hmm. And, you know, that doesn't need to be defeatist. It just needs to be realistic. You know, this is a slowly turning down the hi-fi as we find something else instead. This is not less like press stop situation. Except for the environment, then we pretty much have to just press stop. But, you know, that's a different question. Yeah. So this is a bit of a voiceover for me now. Usually, if anything comes up in an interview, I'll simply pause it. No big deal. Nobody knows about it later because we just cut it out. In this case, 
Marcus and I were having this conversation. I had a text that I first interpreted from my partner as being much more serious than it actually was, thankfully, but I asked him to pause it. When we went back to talking, after I'd confirmed that everything is okay, it's interesting that this actual break in our conversation caused Marcus to come up with some new ideas that I just had to include in the podcast. So that's my explanation of why there's a sort of break here. Now back to the show. It was making me think that in some ways it was quite a fitting uh, yeah. response to my question because I was thinking about what love is and how actually our the bonds that we choose to have with other human beings are exactly the kind of antidote we need more of, you know, that we need to affirm even more so that, uh, you know, the fact that we would need to pause things so that you could speak to your partner is, is absolutely kind of like a, just a you know, perfect illustration really. Well, it's interesting, too, that it was a quick text and, I, you know, there was a miscommunication, but I wouldn't have had that without the sort of social media connections that we have and that we share, although I don't know if that's good or bad because I worried for nothing, maybe. But well, at least you were able to kind of, you know, find out and, you know, know quickly and stuff like that. Yeah. For anyone who hasn't checked out your book yet, I mean, in the afterword, there are a number of sort of strategies in order to... Uh, if you're not going to leave social media, you can at least do a number of things such as uh, putting pressure on social media platforms to do sort of more ethical things, to try not to care too much about numbers uh, like likes or retweets and these kinds of things because it means that the adversaries are not going to pay as much attention necessarily, which is perhaps a good thing. And there are a number of things that I won't go over because, like I said, anyone who wants to check out the book definitely should. But I'm curious to know a little bit more about how you are using or not using social media. So you mentioned how you were on Facebook and are no longer. Mm -hmm. What decisions have you made and perhaps um, what research or what concepts have helped you make those decisions as you negotiate that for yourself? Well, one of those things that the more you start to look at it, the more sinister you feel that it is. Mm -hmm. I mean, my re reasons for going off Facebook were only partly because of the things that I've written about. And it's funny, you say about putting pressure on social media platforms. It's beyond my wildest dreams now how much pressure is on Mark Zuckerberg and Sheryl Sandberg mm -hmm. um, at Facebook, you know, how much scrutiny there is on Facebook. That has changed so much in the two and a half years since I started writing that, that book. The writing began in, in April 2016. And even in that time, it's just wow, it's, it's so different. So obviously, that's great. And I'm really happy to see that people are a bit more suspicious now. I mean, I guess speaking more personally, I also just really didn't like the way it forces our sociality through a certain filter. Various things happened where I would, you know, maybe find out someone really close to me was moving to another country via Facebook first, hmm. or, you know, things like that, that were just kind of probably clumsy but also really to do with like the affordances of the platform in the way that, or maybe it's the reverse of an affordance because affordance is obviously things that technology enables, but those things that technology enables are not necessarily good. And like one of the things that like me and my students look at is, um, which is widely studied of course as well, is social networks and identity. And Facebook is very anti, you know, the plurality of identity. Um, they don't really subscribe to or to pay much attention to the theories of context collapse. For them, they want you to add your boss, your girlfriend, and your parents. They want everyone to be like friends with you on Facebook, basically via the same profile and to get the same updates. And mm -hmm. they don't really care about the differences there. And I think that's the thing is like sometimes if you've got to have like a really important conversation with someone you're close to, you probably put more time and effort into that and care into that. But some old friend you haven't spoken to for ages messages you or comments on your post, you might let slip something that you haven't spoken to a loved one about yet because, you know, we're working up to it or whatever. And it's clumsy, but these are exactly the kinds of things that, that happen every day uh, on Facebook. And I just think for me, it was a combination of those sorts of things and the stuff that I've written about that just made me feel like this is really not good. Like the human beings in my life that are important to me, I want to have control over how I communicate with them, what they tell me, what I tell them. And that's something we have always had, you know, as social creatures, we're very sort of equipped to do that. We don't need this blue and white thing to kind of manage our social lives for us. We really don't. And the danger is if we allow ourselves to start needing it, and becoming dependent on it, then we will 
not be so good at or find it so easy to engage with each other in other ways. So that's a really important aspect of it. Mm -hmm. I don't know if this is going to be addressed in in subsequent questions. So I will just say it now, as far as the things that come up at the end of the book, and what we were talking about before you had to uh, ring off that there's a line in the Mark Fisher book about um, kind of how we question what's inevitable. And a lot of people have quoted it now when um, Fisher died, his students painted the same thing on the wall at Goldsmiths. This is after my book had gone to print, but I I was really glad to see that they had also picked up on that because one of the most important things in the book, emancipatory politics must always destroy the appearance of a natural order, must Mm -hmm. reveal what is presented as necessary and inevitable to be a mere contingency, just as it must make what was previously impossible seem attainable. Facebook is not something that we just have to kind of accept its role in our lives in the kind of natural order of our lives in in late capitalism. We, We can actually take issue with it. We can we can question the role that it has. We can push back. And when we start to question these things that are that, that want us to consider them inevitable, we can change the conversation. And that's really important. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about that quote, actually, and the idea behind it, because I think it is incredibly important. I hope I didn't preempt. But... No, it was perfect. It's a perfect sort of segue into into what I wanted to ask you more about, which is, I would say, one of the ways that you clearly go about this is through your work, right? Through your book, because you, you make things that seem inevitable not look quite so inevitable anymore. And you make things that may, in in some sense, seem impossible look more possible. Well, I hope so. That bit's a lot more difficult. Yeah, but I can see, especially as you quote that and as you, as you talk about your inspirations or your, the theorists and writers that you've turned to in the book, I can clearly see that line of thinking. Now, for people who are perhaps reading your book and not working on this kind of thing or not, um, particularly interested in writing their own or researching their own work in this, this idea, but nevertheless find themselves compelled to try to rethink social media and their use of it and this public's use of it. Do you have any thoughts on how we might go about that? Whether it's, of course, clicking off Facebook or deleting your account, but um, how we might go about thinking differently than than what's very tempting to think right now, which is that it's inevitable, everyone's on Facebook, I better join it, or the new thing. How might we start to rethink that? We start to rethink that by mixing our conversation about social media with our conversation about the structural nature of the world more generally. I think it's this kind of what we're talking about before it in the sense of things being connected, that we need to learn to do much better. And I'm really happy to see, for instance, in the recent kind of, you know, incoming congressmen and women and the kinds of conversations that are occurring in American, North American politics at the moment, that there's kind of a mixing together of you know, the people who want to prioritize the environment are talking to the people who want to think about you know, jobs in the economy, who uh, want to also talk about, you know, American foreign policy, for instance, they're having a conversation that's like, much more than one issue. And like, in terms of social media companies, basically, my work involves following a number of people and and seeing what they say, and you know, the, the links that they post and stuff like that, because I still use Twitter, I will admit, it's a very, very useful resource for me to kind of keep track of what's happening in the world. So yeah, you know, there's my complicity. But um, the people who are really, really savagely attacking the social media world, I'll just call out a couple of people who I think if you want to see, if listeners want to see the critique and where it's at, I would highly recommend the blog posts of a guy called Aral Balkan. He's quoted in the book. He's got a very sharp critique of Google and Facebook in particular, much sharper than my critique. Really, really, really kind of savage. And of course, um, Shoshana Zuboff as well, who's just come out with a new book about surveillance capitalism as well. And they both are interesting because as leaders in that conversation, they are connecting the things they see and say about social media to a broader critique of capitalism and of the way that we live, you know, at this moment in time. More people need to be doing that and we need to be getting better at that. And, you know, I come from a particular kind of, was raised around a a table of a particular tradition of Marxian critical theory, cultural studies, etc., has enabled me to kind of grasp some how those conversations are supposed to work, I guess. Mm -hmm. Um, But I think there's more work to be done there. And it's a kind of, as I said before, a kind of big picture thinking that I think we we are losing. But if we can do that better, then we'll realize the conversation isn't only about social media and the actions we need to take are not only 
whether you're on social media or not. They're actually, when you're resisting social media, you're resisting something much broader than social media. That's the thing we have to keep coming back to. And that's actually the same set of processes that, you know, if you're going to talk about journalism education, you know, the same set of processes that are affecting journalism and what it is as well and what it will become and the technologies that it uses and so forth and the issues that it covers, everything from foreign wars to environmental issues and so forth. All of these things do have a kind of, there's a great benefit from having conversations about how they relate to one another. And I think that my resistance to social media is informed by those kinds of broader conversations, but that's something we need to do, do more of. Something that you mentioned right before we started recording was that it's difficult to stay up to date with every new social media change or policy tweak or new app that's coming out because it's difficult in general to stay up to date with this. But if you're specializing in this and you want to learn and critically think through a lot of the things that are going on in our technological world, it's very challenging to stay up to date on everything. And I think that goes back to your earlier point about thinking about bigger picture issues such as uh, neoliberalism, capitalism, and the ways in which these larger structures are structuring things like Facebook or Twitter and so on. Yeah. There's a temptation, though, to either have news feeds going all the time, which I'm sure is not what you're, you're suggesting, where it pings you every time there's a new development in whatever's going on online. That's virtually impossible to stay on top of. But then there's, a, there's also, I think, a temptation to step back from all of that and not look at what's going on and just think in a very general way and simply read critical theory, which I'm definitely in favor of, but not 100%. <laughs> so how do you negotiate that? Like staying up to date on the technologies that are out there, the changes that are being made, the stories or exposés that are coming out, but also thinking through concepts like, you know, just reading Capital. If you if you haven't yet uh, as a listener or, or what have you, it's it's a time-consuming thing, right, to work through that kind of literature. Yeah. How do you balance that, or how do you uh, how do you attempt to balance that? Well, I mean, a, a big part of what's missing, I think, is actually is conversation. It's not about just like you as an individual and your relationship to the world mm -hmm. only. That's a rather kind of, and this is not a critique of you at all. I think it's a structural, or you know, of what you just said. But mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's a structural kind of fact that most of us are forced, even when we are in long-term relationships or we have families or whatever, that our professional activity is largely confined to individual solitary work. I'm in a department with nine other excellent human beings who all do excellent work, I think, and I'm very much in awe of what they do. But my research and thinking is still amazingly solitary. And so now I've, I've taken steps in my own life to change that. You know, I organize once a year an annual conversation that is about speaking to my friends who are, you know, environmentalists professionally or scientists or lawyers or, you know, unemployed or whatever artists, you know, and actually bringing people together around a table uh, once a year and actually just trying to have a joined up conversation with them about what, what they're seeing and then a kind of thinking about how the things that we all do or know about can support each other. And obviously that sounds very privileged and I know not everyone is in necessarily a position to be able to do that. So I'm not saying that that's the only way, but mm -hmm. you know, conversations, even with the people who are in your neighborhood, aren't happening enough. And we could be, rather than all sitting there with our, with our kind of smartphone or, or laptop with our headphones on in some kind of coffee joint with distressed enamel mugs and exposed brickwork and houseplants and natural light, we could actually be kind of organizing more events and going to, you know, having more conversations with one another. And I think in a secular world, um, I'm personally like a non-theist. I think one of the things that I learned from talking to religious friends is that they still have something in their life, which although nominally it might be about organized religion, also facilitates a degree of talking about what's happening in the world and, and, and giving meaning to it, which, okay, I know some grad students also have that, but there is no such thing as too much of that, really, unless I guess you're a massive introvert. <laughs> hmm. um, I don't know. I, I feel like the disappearance of that is part of the conditions of that very world that you know we need to address, because building up collective structures and, and collective meaning again is a big part of how we change um, and how we change direction and how we how we build a different better world 
Yeah, I definitely think that that's important. I was thinking as you started to say that, when I hear conversation these days, even though I'm doing this podcast and I'm thankful to people like you who are willing to talk and discuss things with me, when I hear conversation, I often think like, I'm in conversation with this theorist because I wrote this article and then he or she might respond in an article. And it's not exactly a conversation that, that we tend to have as, as a traditional, you know, face to face thing, which seems almost to have disappeared through this enclosure yeah. of social media kind of taking over what used to be perhaps a public sphere, although maybe that's more idealized than we care to admit. Is there a way of sort of, I don't want to say going back because I don't want to say that things were perfect before social media. But do you see do you see a sort of escape or do you see a way of of changing? So not using the tools to dismantle what's there necessarily, but of changing them in a better way. I'm curious if you think there is a way to, to get off social media sort of and move on to something else or simply to have it hopefully change into something different. I see. I see the question. I feel like you're very patiently asking me to give you an answer and I keep going off on tangents. No, no, no. Um, I mean, if there was one clear answer, that would be, yeah, that would be amazing. <laughs> but I definitely am not expecting that. Although I, I'm, I'm more curious to see how you, how you envision a future. Because as we sort of uh, come to a, a wrap up of this interview, I'd be interested to hear more after doing this work, thinking about it, choosing, for example, to go off of Facebook. Where do you see us going and where do you hope we go? Does it look more like it did in the past where we might have gotten together more often face to face? Or is there something else? I'm, I'm just curious where you see this project going of a better sort of communication and information exchange and dialogue and such. Right. The best we can do is question the inevitability of these things. This is not something that we just all apply a certain technique and the stuff goes away. Mm -hmm. It's going to just get more and more tempting. Whatever they find out we like, they'll make more of it and tempt us on to it that way. That's that's how this works. You know, they're constantly doing user testing. They're constantly trying to figure out what will drive engagement. This is an attention economy. So I, I feel a little bit pessimistic about the, the idea that we'll all eventually kind of get bored of, uh, of Facebook or that we can kind of have some sort of revolution against it either. Both, both seem a little bit improbable. In a way, the question then becomes, how do we escape <laughs> the, the kind of circular uh, zaps dystopia of, of late capitalism itself? And, you know, I don't know whether history is a pendulum or whether it's you know, a, a just the constant changing same or, or, you know, people would see it differently. But I do think that we kind of need to be able to identify and call out the structures of how it operates. And that's the bit that's missing from the conversation. We can call each other out and, and that in the end becomes just a, a part of the problem. Instead, we need to be calling out those structure, uh, uh, structures. And as far as like individually, you know, specific social media stuff, I think the kinds of social media usage that we see are a symptom. And I think that if they're a symptom, a bit like if you have a rash, let's figure out what the cause of that symptom is and let's address that. Mm -hmm. And if large numbers of people are experiencing, you know, mental health difficulties like depression and anxiety and bipolar disorder, etc., let's figure out why. Let's have conversations about what the causes of that are. And maybe that will make it harder for social media companies to exploit that need for escape, which is basically what they do. We need to go to the source of the problem. And, and like I say, that involves having a much bigger conversation than just talking about uh, about social media. And certainly in my future work, I will be kind of drawing out my focus away from social media platforms. Um, there's a number of other conversations we could have. There are definitely conversations to have around technology more broadly. So Evgeny Morozov wrote a few years ago that fantastic book about solutionism. Mm -hmm. And you see aspects of what Facebook's other businesses are doing, like Oculus and so forth, that are on the one hand solutionist, um, and on the other hand, kind of a bit naive and sin that sort of weird combination of naivety and sinister <laughs> stuff that Silicon Valley so often seems to have. Then I think well, I don't know how long you got. <laughs> we need to talk about what liberalism is and what like the sort of centrist position has done for us. It's really interesting to me, for instance, to look at the links between political centrism and the technology world. The fact that Hillary Clinton uh, was rumored to, and it's now been leaked, that she was going to have Sheryl Sandberg, CEO of Facebook, and Tim Cook, CEO of Apple, 
she was going to invite them to her to her cabinet, you know, or that Nick Clegg, the former leader of the Liberal Democrats in the UK, now works for Facebook. Because there are certain kinds of politics that for a long time, in a slightly Fukuyama-esque way, we, we sort of all bought into because we thought, well, this, this kind of works for everyone, really, yeah. except that it never quite did. And in a way, we wouldn't have the far right now if we didn't have that kind of slightly sinister, slightly naive, centrist thing where we're super socially liberal, and that's great, of course. Um, but actually, you know, the social liberalism of the center is often the product of actually quite radical civil rights struggles, you know, whether it's struggles for racial equality in, in, in places in America or gay rights or, you know, gender equality. These, these come from the radical fringes. They're appropriated by a kind of free market centrism that says, yeah, we can use this stuff as a kind of like honey for our sandwich. We can sweeten the deal for everyone with these things and then we can carry on doing like free market stuff underneath, you know, underneath and no one will notice. And then, of course, people get really mad with the fact that their job was shipped overseas or what have you. And so they get really mad at the, the social liberal stuff as well. Given the breakdown of, you know, our educational structures and our means for learning about the world and, you know, journalism and factual media and so forth, it's not really a surprise that they are not able to make that distinction. Because to make that distinction, you need you need a degree of thinking structurally and seeing the big picture, the very things that I've been educated both in the US and the UK in, in you know, state run secondary school. And I can tell you that those things are missing from both systems. Mm -hmm. Bring those things back in and people would have been able to see, as I think they're beginning to wake up to now, the problems with that. Of course, we need equality between all human beings, uh, but we also need a sustainable way of organizing our, our economies and our technologies and so forth so that they don't destroy the future of generations to come. The conversation has got to broaden out so that we can talk about those other issues as well and see that, you know, Silicon Valley and these technologies have a place in that. They're part of those broader conversations. But in a sense, they don't really make much sense unless we're really willing to ask the bigger questions. And whatever listeners may think of Bernie Sanders or, or AOC or you know these other people who are changing American political conversations now, even if you disagree with everything that they say, you need them because the status quo that they are answering is one that is extremely damaging. And I probably people are going to say, oh, well, that sounds like you could say the same thing about Donald Trump. I think there are so many disadvantages to Donald Trump that I, I don't think I could possibly say the same thing. <laughs> but, you know, in the case of Brexit in the UK, much as I wholeheartedly voted to remain and I, I, I you know, really think that this is all a horrible mistake. Mm. Um, it has shattered some of the things about our political landscape that needed to shatter, which then enable the green shoots of new conversations to start taking place in a way that probably wouldn't have been possible in a world where, you know, we just carried on pretending everything was fine. Yeah. I mean, that gives listeners and myself so much to think about. And it highlights, I think, one of the strengths of this work is that you are able to look at something like Facebook or Instagram and ex sort of step back and explain why this is a very important political element of a much bigger system in a neoliberal late capitalist society. So, I mean, there's so much more we could say, but I don't want to take up any more of your time, Marcus. I really appreciate you speaking about your work and your thoughts. And I think, uh, like I said, it gives us all a lot more to think about after having a conversation like this. So I really appreciate it. Not at all. It's my pleasure. As always, thank you for listening to This Is Not A Pipe podcast. I'm sure you know this already, but Marcus's five book recommendations are available at tinapp.org for you to check out. There's also a new button on the site called Buy Me A Coffee, which is a cool company I've just come in contact with. Basically, it's exactly what it sounds like. It's a nice and easy way to show support. Maybe some people will send some coffees. Definitely check out what Marcus and others have written at tinapp.org. Until next time, I'm Chris Richardson. Cheers.